Check, check, check. One, two, three, four. Well, welcome everyone to, uh, to this afternoon's sessions on the solar eclipse. This was advertised as being a, a seminar or a conference. Uh, what do we got? Panel, a panel. I think our three presenters are all here at the same time. Uh, we've got uh, Dan Ward, who's going to talk on astrophotography last. We've got George Doshek. I think George, is, George was here. Yeah. Um, who's um, going to talk about the, the nature of what you see. And we're leading off with Dr. Mike Reynolds, who spoke as our keynote, who's going to talk about the experience of seeing the eclipse. Uh, and the idea being that if you ask a question, the, the right person will be in the room, even though we're not really having a, a full up panel discussion. Each one has a, has a presentation. But we're all here, and we can have a, a, an informal discussion as well as the formal presentations. So uh, I went over Mike's uh, credentials when he first spoke here. I'll, I'll go over it again briefly. Uh, Dr. Mike Reynolds is a professor in astronomy at Univers uh, Cal Florida State College, Jacksonville. Got it. Uh, he's also executive director of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. He's an avid eclipse goer. He's an avid astronomical outreach expert. Uh, he's, he's one of those people who goes around and truly motivates people in observational astronomy, both in his areas of expertise and in general amateur astronomy. Uh, he has become an expert in solar eclipses, but I understand his, his previous research interests were primarily meteoritics, and uh, so he's done a lot and can explain a lot. He also was an observatory, a planetarium manager and director, so he understands how to explain things to the public, which is a very rare and, and valuable skill. So with that, I'll turn it over to Di Dr. Mike Reynolds, and we'll get started. And for this recording, I think I will try to pass the mic around when people have questions, because I think this will be one of the more interesting set of talks for the afternoon, and we want to record the questions or maybe have them repeated, as well as the answers. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Alan. And it really is good to be here. I'm pleased to be the first of the three musketeers to talk about this little event that will happen in less than a month. I can remember after the 2012 eclipse thinking, well, you know what? It's been a long time, but 2017, that'll be terrific. So it's here. And, you know, shortly we'll be talking about seeing a, a spectacular total solar eclipse. Now let me ask a question I asked the other night. How many of you have never seen a total solar eclipse? Let's see, show of hands. Make sure you get there. Right? The only message I want you to take home from me get to the line of totality and try to get to a place where it's clear. That's kind of helpful too. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kick things off and I may take a little bit less time so we can have more time for Q&A. Um, talking about my topic here and I'm gonna kick it off by talking about eclipses, a little historical, a little eclipse mechanics. Most of the stuff, some of you will be saying, okay Reynolds, yeah, we know this. But you know what I learned as a professor? I would not explain things I thought students knew, like north, south, east, west. And I had a student who was brave enough to raise her hand, even though you know, always say no dumb questions, or you know there are no dumb questions, who said, Dr. Reynolds, I really don't understand cardinal points, north, south, east, west. It's a college student, I'm thinking, well, Sometimes we just, you know, presume everybody knows these things. So let me just go ahead and get into this, and hopefully Arlen's got me squared away. I won't screw things up. 27 days, 21 hours, and 6 minutes. But again, who's counting? That's before first contact in Oregon. Um, less than a month. Now, I want to know who bought the new telescope and brought it up here. Because you know that is a Murphy's Law. You buy a new telescope and it's cloudy for 30 days. Just buy and take out of the box no new telescope in the next month. We well, you know these technical definitions of eclipses from Webster's Dictionary. The total or partial obscuring of a celestial body by another or the passing into the shadow of a celestial body. 
Those are those scientific terms that we as astronomers kind of associate with. But those of you who've been to a total solar eclipse know whether you're going just to look or you want to photograph, which I know Dan's going to do a great job on talking about photography. He and I have compared notes. I heard him speak at, the, at your um, astronomy day last April. No matter what your interest is, it's amazing how it affects people. And I'll leave it like that because I'll show you pictures and you'll hear descriptions and, and see a lot of photos. You'll hear us ooh and all about it. You can't describe it. You can't. So, first of all, just a little mechanics. It's just kind of cool how our solar system laid out for us. If you think about the, the sun and moon diameters in the sky, they're both 30 arc minutes, approximately 30 arc minutes in diameter. But, of course, in the real universe, this is a fun thing to talk to my students about, even though they think math is a four-letter word. Get it? Four-letter word is the fact that the sun's 400 times bigger, but the moon's 400 times closer. So you get this really cool geometry that plays into our solar system and our solar system only. Michael Bockage of Astronomy Magazine and I wrote a book, college lab book, it was just recently published. And you know, the problems with trying to draw any of these diagrams, of course, is they're never to scale. And that's one of the major peeves I have with any book that tries to show, you know, why we see phases of moon, eclipses. So I always have my students actually lay it out, like a yardstick eclipse or step out the solar system with toilet paper, by the way. Stellar heliocentric illustration tissue. <laughs> I'll let you figure that one. Each sheet is a million miles and <laughs> takes about four rolls to get to Pluto. So anyway, um, solar eclipse anatomy is pretty straightforward. It's where you have a new moon come between the sun and earth, um, moon's outer shadow, the partial eclipse is called the penumbra, the inner shadow where you want to be in less than a month is called the umbra. Um, what happens here is you have some dynamics that play in. Partial solar eclipses, of course, occur as kind of like the, I call it the appetizer to totality. Um, or if you're, again, only the penumbral part of shadow um, hits the Earth. Annular solar eclipses, how many of you have ever seen an annular? They're cool, too. They're cool in a different way. See an annular if you can. See a total first. See five totals first. Annulars are they're different, aren't they, Debbie? This, they appear different. We um, went to the uh, May 2012 annular in Page, Arizona. And there was a good sized group of us. We took our grandsons and we ended up viewing the eclipse with a Navajo family who was there for a picnic. We had a great time. And this little two year old Navajo girl was running around with her eclipse classes telling everybody, see the sun, see the sun. That was worth it right there. It was just terrific. So sometimes you have the moon in its apogee where it's slightly smaller than the sun unit with this annular or ring eclipse is actually a partial eclipse, or of course, the glory of totality itself. So what happens sometimes, you end up with this geometry such that Earth, Moon, Sun line is not a perfect straight line, and you end up with a partial eclipse, or you're under that part of the shadow that's only the, known as the penumbra. What we like, of course, is this nice straight line um, in this case, the moon's a little further away, what we call its apogee, a mini moon or micro moon, they're now calling it. And then, of course, what we really want is the super moon, um, where you have a um, perigee occur close to perigee where the moon does cover the sun. And you end up with the, the glorious totality. And again, just a nice comparison that was from astronomy picture of the day. And I love it, you know, all of a sudden, it's like super moons and micro moons became this thing like we'd never heard of them before. And so now everybody's, oh, there's a super moon tonight. And Dr. Reynolds, how often does this occur? Is this, will I ever see another one in my lifetime? So you have to kind of do some education. This is a great NASA um, video of the March 9, 2016 total solar eclipse um, um, taken by the Earth Observatory. And you can see 
the moon's shadow as it races across Earth. Uh, some really nice work's been done there. And we'll see some more. Lunar eclipse is just to throw it in again because being a college professor, I have to, you know, make sure you're smart. So lunar eclipse is where the Earth slips between the um, sun and moon. And, of course, you can have a penumbral lunar eclipse, a partial lunar eclipse, or a total lunar eclipse. And I'm probably kind of weird in that I like penumbral eclipses. The slight shadings on the moon are just, I think, just really kind of in enticing. Now, I know professional astronomers aren't supposed to say things like romantic or beautiful or lovely, but they're beautiful and lovely. Okay, I'll just leave it like that. Um, I love photographing total lunar eclipses, too. And, uh, again, just, just very spectacular. I've done timings of shadows and had my students do that sort of thing. It's, you know, uh, shadow crossings for craters. But back to our topic, um, August 21, 2017. Unfortunately, or fortunately, because we'd probably all go broke trying to travel the one total solar eclipse once a month, the Earth-Sun line geometry is tilted about five degrees to the Earth-Moon line, or you can say vice versa. So most of the time, the Moon goes above or below the Sun, and we see no eclipse whatsoever. And maybe that's probably a fortunate thing. That eclipses to me are very special. So, a quick summary. Um, comparing Earth, Sun, and Moon relative to each other. First, we of course want to talk about um, what we're here for, solar eclipses where you have the moon. It slides between sun and earth. We talked briefly, which I'm not going to say much more about beyond this. Lunar eclipses where the earth slides between moon and sun. The earth's shadow is cast on the um, moon. And then I bet you didn't realize there's a third type of an eclipse. It's called an apocalypse. <laughs> you know, where the sun goes between the Earth and moon. I don't want you, I have people ask me about this all the time. When, when's the next time the sun's going to come between the earth and moon? Uh, that's right, that's my answer. And they, really? <laughs> so anyway, apocalypse. Um, eclipses on other planets. On um, Mars, this is actually a photograph from, I don't know if it's from, it's one of the rovers. Yeah, look, isn't that kind of interesting? So that's a Martian um, solar eclipse. Jupiter, you have, remember, relatively speaking, size of, of the sun from Earth, sun from Mars, Jupiter, and actually, that's too big. Um, I must have copied the wrong dot, but you get the idea. If you're talking about Jupiter, first you have to survive floating in the atmosphere. And then you're not going to see, you know, the sun's just not very big. You get Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and it's not very good whatsoever. So another piece of wonderful NASA animation for our upcoming events where you see first the penumbral and then the umbral shadow as it races across first the Pacific, touches land in Oregon, across Idaho, Casper, where I know a number of you are going to be in Casper, Nebraska has been kind of ignored, which may be one of the best spots. We're going to be just north of Kansas City in St. Joseph, St. Louis, Nashville, grazes Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and out to sea. So we'll talk more about in a minute the travel issues, but there it is. And um, again, what a great opportunity for all of us. If the weather holds out, knock on wood to see a grand eclipse. This is a map that was produced by Michael Zeiler. Uh, you may know the name. He has the website greatamericaneclipse.com. Michael, by day, is a cartographer. He works for Estuary and he does GIS mapping. And he got hooked on eclipses. Been to 10 of them now with his wife, Polly. And so he started producing incredible maps of eclipses and eclipse paths and that sort of thing. And so um, this is Michael's map of totality for this year in the partial 
um, zones, should I say, and showing the various amounts of time for totality. And, and you know, it really has become a national event. It's going to be interesting to see how the press reacts a few days before and leading up to in the eclipse itself. But there's all sorts of opportunities. Solar sip and see. You know, maybe that's a little moonshine. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> eclipse rum, corona. Okay, so get out of all my system. But nonetheless, you can see a variety of opportunities. And maybe the most interesting of them all, I don't know if you've heard of this, but there is an event called Moonstock. It's an eclipse festival. And it's going to be held in Cartersville, Illinois. But it gets better. The Moonstock is a music festival that will last four days. The headliner is Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> who is going to sing at totality, Bark at the Moon. <laughs> As only Ozzy can do not. I tell you what, that's a scary thought. And if I wasn't really into doing the eclipse thing and we're taking our grandkids and that sort of thing, I'd be there just to watch the people. <laughs> Can you imagine? This, this is just going to be, this is going to be something. I'm, I'm sure they'll all be eclipsed before the eclipse even, even occurs, but Ozzy Osbourne. So, people ask me all the time, and I've, I mentioned this the other night, that since January, I'm out of town somewhere speaking every other weekend, which is great, because people are really interested. That's good news, and that's well, it's good news. People always ask me, where is the best place? Where are you going to go, Reynolds? So you know you've got a good track record. You've been to 18. You've seen 18. Where are you going to go? I'm thinking, oh, my God, talking about pressure. So where do you want to go? Simple answer, where it's clear. And that is, I mean, come on, we all live on the East Coast, or most of us do. We know that that's, that's going to be the big variable. And I think the beauty of all that is that there's really good weather data supporting previous years and the new GO-16 satellite, I think four or five days out, you're going to have a good feel for what systems are where and where the best spots may well be. Jay Anderson, a retired Canadian meteorologist, um, has done a, a really extensive study of sky dynamics around the time of totality. And as you might imagine, out here in, in Oregon, once you get off the coast, it gets pretty good. You slide on into Idaho, there's some nice spots. Casper, I know a number of you are going to go to Casper. Again, I think Nebraska is probably the most ignored state of them all. Um, we're going to be right here in St. Joe, which is just north of, of Kansas City. And you head on east, and well, you can see as you start to get down towards South Carolina, Columbia, Charleston, I mean, it's summer. But, you know, I mean, look at the cloud cover studies for the last um, six years. Got a little swirl here from last year. And actually, South Carolina doesn't look too bad. Look at this. So, watch the weather. That's my number one advice. Watch the weather. And again, I think the GO-16 satellite is going to really help us understand where, those, where the best skies will be. Presumably, those are all taken at the time of totality. They were all ta yes, thank you for, for mentioning that. They're all taken at the time of totality. That is correct. Yeah, but they can't all be the right time. Well, the what they did is they, they did a compo composition, Alan. So they okay. start West Coast. And so it's adjusted for, for the time, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. See, that's the beauty of speaking to a group of a lot of your scientists. You understand those things. Most people, what's well, a cloud? You know, it's not that bad, but you know what I'm saying. So I want to quickly talk about some interesting historical eclipses. One of these days, I'm going to write an article for astronomy about historical eclipses because this stuff is really neat. You know, we think of ourselves as being entrepreneurs and adventure some people and we go on these eclipses man got news for you and you know this one of the favorite places to start for me is the two chinese astronomers si and ho they were the emperor's astronomers and their whole job was to explain 
astronomical events to show the emperor's divinity, that he was divine. Well, the problem was they did not predict one particular total solar eclipse, and they literally were terminated. Talk about job security. I asked Fred Espinac, as you know, Fred, of course, is really, I consider him Mr. Eclipse. I actually consider him the dean of eclipses. I said, Fred, do you ever feel that pressure? He said, every once in a while. But he said, luckily, I can blame NASA instead. Um, some fun eclipse lore and legend I'll go through quickly. Stonehenge, of course, we think about that as a possibility of being uh, a way to predict lunar eclipses. The Chinese term for eclipse is qi, which means to eat. A royal dragon eating the sun. The ancient Chaldeans, of course we're talking about Middle East there, believed the eclipse was a display of the moon's anger. The Babylonians did some razzmatazz mathematics to determine which quadrant would have the worst disasters because of the eclipse. Um, there's a, a Catholic priest it was by the name of Saint Benedict and he saw an eclipse when he was younger and had such an effect on him that he be, uh, started this thing called the Benedictine Society which is I understand something that's still in um, use today this is a one of the European chapels and um, here's Saint Benedict totally eclipsed sun and like these ethereal rays woo, and reaching down and grabbing Benedict and making that impact on, which a number of you will understand once you see a total solar eclipse. Peloponnesian War, decided on the heels of a lunar eclipse. One of the saddest, but strangest, of course, is Columbus. Kind of shipwrecked in Jamaica. He and his men demanding that Jamaican natives bring them food and rum. And the natives finally said, we've had enough of this. We're not doing this anymore for you, Columbus. Columbus knew there was a total lunar eclipse coming up, saying to them, if you don't bring me my liquor and our food, I'm going to make this, the moon disappear. The eclipse occurred. Natives freaked. Oh, we'll bring you anything you want, Columbus. Okay, I'll bring the moon back this time, but don't do it again. And the eclipse is over. Sounds like hotel, hotel reservations for this eclipse. Today, um, and having traveled around the world, I've seen a lot of this where people make noise. It was in Africa, one of the eclipses in Africa, Debbie, that people were banging pots and pans to chase away the, and starting fires to chase away the evil eclipse. Did it really? I mean, again, now we're going to get some United States stuff, Patricia, but I have to remember that one. But you, you tell me more about that so I can add that to my story. It, um, I won't make any, okay, we'll move on. I, I, interesting comments I'll share with you come to mind, but having lived in California, I understand. Some wells in Japan are covered because of celestial poisoning. People turn over their spoons and forks so they don't get contaminated. In India, people kind of hide themselves because of the sun's evil rays. And worldwide, there was an eclipse I went to in um, Bolivia that pregnant women were not allowed outside during the partial or total phase because they were afraid the baby would be affected. Now you think, okay Reynolds, you're picking on the world. I've reserved, Patricia, you gotta tell me more about this too, but I'm, I've reserved the best for us. All right, so prior to the 1979 eclipse, a man calls a radio station and asks if they needed the eclipse glasses to watch the eclipse on TV. My favorite of these, so they're all pretty funny. A doctor visited his, a patient visited his doctor and asked if the eclipse could have caused his girlfriend's pregnancy. And there was a nice annular eclipse in 1994, went up like mid United States. Um, a woman called the local planetarium and asked the planetarium director if she could let her dog go back outside. She didn't want her dog to look at the eclipse and go blind. So make sure, no matter what you do, make sure your dog <laughs> has its glasses on. Okay? 
safe solar viewing. This is, <coughs> okay, I'm going to say it. It's a sun dog. Thank you, thank you. I know, I know. Um, I like this photograph. Um, good friend of mine, Richard Sweeter, I wrote uh, um, this book. Somewhere it's here. This book on eclipses. And we wanted something different than the kind of, which are wonderful, typical eclipse picture on the cover. So we found this um, photograph that was in the Royal Astronomical Society's files. And it's of a 1878 expedition celebrating after the eclipse. Notice they're all in coats and ties. Yeah, right. They're all in coats and ties. They're vests, smoking cigars. Um, top hats on some of them is kind of interesting. Now, I'm not going to talk at all about eclipse photography except from a historical viewpoint. The first really good photograph of a total solar eclipse was taken in 1851 with an 84-second exposure. I mean, think about the patience needed for that. And then on the right-hand side, it's a photograph taken in Northern California, um, January 1st, 1889 eclipse. And this particular eclipse is what started the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So it's kind of interesting to see the historical links there. Give you a feel of eclipses across the United States from the founding of the country to today. Um, my first eclipse, which I'll talk about in a moment, was March 7th, 1970. Uh, here we are right here. So you see there hasn't been a lot of eclipses that have total eclipses that have crossed the US. Kind of an interesting viewpoint there. Nearly a hundred years ago. Um, last time totality went from coast to coast. And it's from the Denver Post. I love this little thing I've got in red down here. Police enforce quiet, so astronomers at university may make priceless observations. Movies to be taken, throngs seek vantage points. It's kind of cool, isn't it? I think we may see it even more so at this particular eclipse. New York Times, January 24th, 1925. Eclipse four seconds late. I wonder someone lost their head for that one. But a brilliant show seen from land, sea, and air. It thrills millions. Sea halts the gaze. Scientists now study the data. It's kind of interesting. 1963. So think about that leap from the 20s to 63. Um, a total solar eclipse just clipped the state of Maine, mostly in Canada. My first eclipse, March 7, 1970. And um, the first time an eclipse was photographed with a satellite. So starting point, but let me just go back for a second. Did anyone else see this eclipse? Okay, good. A, a couple of us did. It, it was just, for me, it was my first. And, you know, did you really? Yeah, I saw from way across Georgia. And it, <laughs> did you? Gainesville. So you were in you were in, in, in good old we call it Hogtown. We both went to Gatorland, should I say? So anyway, yeah, it's quite a trip down memory lane. February twenty sixth, the last time an eclipse touched the United States, a total solar eclipse. Uh, we were up in um, Manitoba, north of Winnipeg, for that eclipse on July eleventh. I went across Hawaii, and we ended up going to south of Mexico City and had a glorious view. I love interacting with the local people. And it was Debbie and myself, 25 of our, of our friends and our son and daughter, and a young Mexican fellow pulled up 15, 20 minutes before totality and asked if he could, his English was actually pretty good, asked if he could join us for the eclipse. And we asked him if he had ever seen one, and you know, it was, he was terrific. As that shadow came in, and that diamond ring disappeared, he starts yelling, holy sheet, holy sheet. So I remember my son asked me later, Dad, what's a holy sheet? <laughs> well, I'll explain that to you later, Jeremy. 
Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this. We have some up here. The brand new USPS postage stamp. This is a forever stamp. And what's so way cool about this bad boy is when you touch it and you warm it up, the moon comes out. Is that just way cool or what? It's the first thermographic stamp the post office has made. So um, I mentioned, I think the other night, I went to the post office to buy some initially, and they looked at me like I was crazy. Yeah, a, a thermographic, no, we don't do thermographic stamps. So anyway, I think they probably all have learned by now because it's just way cool, isn't it? I'm sorry, I get excited about stuff like this. Um, what do you look for? The partial clips, I call it the appetizer, the diminishing sun, pinhole projection, changes in light as the eclipse progresses. As the light diminishes, you have shadows that are sharpening because they become not quite point sources, but more of a point source. Changes in environment, temperature and wind. About 10 minutes for totality. Some of them will yell out, there's Venus. And you usually see Venus about 10 minutes before totality. Planets, bright stars, shadow, horizon colors, which I'm just blown away with this sunset sunrise effect as these colors wrap all the way around your horizon. Pretty spectacular. And of course, the shadow bands. Pretty elusive, but yet something you can watch for. Then totality. Visible plants and stars, obviously second contact. Bailey's beads and diamond rain, the chromosphere, the corona, the sun's crown, prominences, apparent darkness, and reaction to totality. Humans as well as birds and whatever other animals that may be around you. We were on Easter Island for the 2010 eclipse, and there were some horses nearby, but I didn't notice any like strange reaction. There's all the people that were, were the crazies there. All right, some more humor. One minute to the eclipse. The three blind mice, the early days. <laughs> Mike, Michael Bockage. Michael Bockage of Astronomy introduced me to this, and I went to the, to the artist, M Mark Parisi, and had to buy the, the, the work from him, which I thought was fantastic. But, you know, we all know it's not the eclipse. We're going to hear this from someone's going to say, I think it's going to be less so than we, than we think, but... Someone's going to say, oh, this eclipse will make you go blind. Um, I think I remember hearing that about something else when I was a kid, but I forget what that was. But nonetheless, I think this is kind of, it does bring home the point. You know, we all know this. It's our chance to educate people again, to share with them. You've got to have filters for your eyes or filters for your binoculars, or your telescope or camera. Um, partial eclipse, pinhole projection is really easy to do. Um, straw hats. One of our grandsons for the annular took a card and punched holes in it and made these really cool projections. Um, leaves on a tree. There's all sorts of colanders, like spaghetti colanders. Make a great job. Here's a paddle that had holes drilled in it. You see these little clips to suns. Um, sun spotters. Some sort of projection device, light projection device. Allows a group to see the eclipse. And, of course, photography before and after totality gives you a chance to make sure your focus is good. Dan will talk about that. Um, get you excited. Get you really excited, especially as you start getting, you know, 95, 96, 98, 99%. Diamond ring. I'm already getting excited. All right. Um, maybe you probably know Ron Brecher, who's a terrific astrophotographer. We had a chance to to house with him at the Winter Star Party this year. And so he and I were sharing notes and he took this really nice hydrogen alpha image of a partial solar eclipse. Don't want that at totality, but sure makes a, a nice shot. Sky at, at totality this year. Well, what we're looking at here is again, Venus, Jupiter, there's Mars. Interesting here, Betelgeuse. Sirius, Regulus, real close to the sun. Um, everybody's taking bets whether we're going to see Regulus or not. I think it depends, obviously, on the weather and how much moisture is in the atmosphere. Okay. Oh, 
Oh. Eclipse weather. So Hopefully not. Did anybody hear that Okay. Important stuff. I want to explain this series of photos. Now, again, I'm not showing a lot of photos because Dan's going to talk about photography. Um, we were on an Eclipse cruise. I was one of the speakers, and um, we were north of New Zealand for this eclipse. And I really like taking photos of the shadow, the colors. I mean, this sort of combination. What I really wanted, composure-wise, was cruise ship, ocean, sky, and sun. Well, the ship was oriented such as that I couldn't do that. This is with a 16 millimeter um, Canon lens. And so I said, okay, I'll just do modern art here. So I tilted the camera, as you can see it, put it on a monopod, bungeed it to the rail, determined my exposure for daytime. Um, I was using like F22 or F28, 800th of a second. Set the camera on that. I didn't want it to change exposure length as totality came on. So I shot a photo like every few seconds. You'll see um, like one every, oh, 10 seconds or so as I go through this progression. So you can watch the sky getting a little darker. Notice the ship's bobbing up and down. So look at the colors that are right now, totality. Now watch how much darker the sky gets. And again, the colors at the horizon. The sky's getting darker still. We're getting towards mid-eclipse. And then, sadly, you come back out again. So it's a nice dramatic. And someone said, why haven't you put in a movie? I actually like the stills better. The, uh, this series, I think this series is one every 20 seconds. Um, for f like four minutes. Yeah, this time. Oh, one eight hundredth of a second exposure. Everyone was one eight hundredth of a second at f twenty eight. Because I wanted to get that fo depth of focus, so I used f one f twenty eight. I knew that you know the sun was pretty dang bright. Remember, you're not supposed to photograph the sun or look at it. So, I by the way, I don't have my red tipped cane like the three blind mice yet. Debbie loves photographing people now. She loves going with me on eclipses. She's been to 10. But the first eclipse, or maybe it was a shuttle launch, I forget which, I asked her to take some pictures for me. And she said, Mike, I love you and I'll go with you, but do not get a camera anywhere near me. But she likes taking pictures of people. Look at the colors at the horizon here. She have these fishermen who are out um, fishing during totality. This is a photo I actually took. We're on a, on a, on a boat. And you can see this is the, the top of the boat, um, various things on the boat, a couple people looking at totality. I set those cameras on automatic, so they just take pictures. Um, second contact, diamond ring. Again, Dan's going to talk about this. This is a stacked photo from a hybrid eclipse in April of 2005. What's kind of cool about this thing is obviously you have chromosphere, which you usually don't get, but it's hybrid. Diamond ring, nice inner corona, nice outer corona, and Venus, all one photograph. So what happened, each of us got a different part of the eclipse, then we stacked it, um, registered it and stacked it, and ended up with a, not a bad photo. This is my, I call it my artsy fartsy picture. Last time I used film, we were in Chisamba, Zambia for this eclipse. And um, I used there's stuff called ectochrome. I used ectochrome. So I took a variety of exposures and then stacked them in Photoshop and got this kind of, I don't know, it's ethereal, looks like a flower uh, eye or iris or whatever. Um, my students love it. I then tell them that I, the only course I ever failed in college was art. So what can you say? Another stacked image from an eclipse we were at in, um, in 2006. 
again, gives you that full dynamic range. Um, a lot of this has been doing this for years, and now you're talking about doing this high dynamic range photos where you take a, a series of bracketing, and you know, Love has been doing this for years. This was my luckiest shot ever. So, Easter Island, watching the horses do nothing. A little bit of thin cloud cover, high cover comes over at third contact. I thought, oh, well, you know, we got to see the eclipse and it really made a nice, would make for a nice photo. So I took the picture, went back and started looking. I said, something's wrong with my camera. It's all screwed up because there are lines running through it. Shadow bands. It's the first time two of us captured shadow bands on the cloud. We never saw it. I just, dumb luck, pushed the button the right exposure at the right time and it was shadow bands. Dumb, dumb luck. Sometimes you're lucky. Um, oh yeah, Dan, this is for you. Here's a nice way to <laughs> have your cake and eat it too. I did this for Neef and so I was forced to eat these moon pies for, for Neef. So anyway. Um, How many times you know what? Being a scientist, you need to repeat your experiment a number of times. To, you guys understand that. Um, people, again, Debbie photographs. This was on the island of Marrakei, which is in what used to be called the Gilbert Islands, um, now called Kiribati. And when we went on the island, all the islanders came to meet us. And the town elders, it was fabulous, wasn't it? Just the warmest reception I've ever seen. Plus, they had no McDonald's. I've been to every continent. And this is one of the, I mean, except for Antarctica, this was the only place I've ever been that did not have a McDonald's. That, that was kind of cool. Um, a couple of different eclipse setups, our grandsons observing the um, annular with us. And some of you know Jerry Armstrong, the artist. He did this for me. And so, as you imagine, you dumb dumb, give me gum gum. And my response to that famous movie line is, after the eclipse. So I want nothing to do with the statues during the eclipse. Planning your eclipse experience. Don't wait till last minute. Make sure you got your eclipse glasses, your filters. That's all very important. Um, make sure you're using... CE and ISO certified eclipse glasses. I haven't seen anything else really for sale, so I think you're safe there. Um, a variety of filters. Personally, I'm just giving my own personal bias. I really like the Botter solar filters. Um, Daystar has come out with a really cool Mylar filter. In fact, we have some here. I, when we went to, we went to, they look like this. There's different sizes. You can make, you know, for binoculars or lenses. We went to the Eclipse Expo in St. Louis, and um, Mikey went a little wild buying stuff. Some of the astronomy club members at home wanted it, and so we have a few things left over, and we have a few of those, so if you need some filters, they're not really expensive, which I'm very pleased to say. Um, make sure you get your hotel if you haven't done so already. Um, test your binoculars, telescope, or camera. I love testing on the full moon. And as many eclipses as I've been to, I'm still testing my equipment. So I know that sounds crazy, but you know, you get to be older and you have checklists for things. Alan and I were talking about er that earlier. I mean, I, I have checklists I go down and, and that's probably one of the reasons I get some you know, fairly decent photos. So if you don't do any advanced planning, you don't get your glasses, your filters, get your binoculars ready to go. It's gonna be like a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Trust me. And you've already seen that with hotels, right? You don't do your hotel reservations in advance. Well, you're going to find no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy, except the Bates Motel, <laughs> where you check in, you don't check out. Um, get to your observing site as early as you can. Plan to make weather-related relocation in advance, you may end up with that. Seriously, this can be a real issue of was part of the various American Astronomical Society NASA Eclipse workshops we had. We had five of them in total. 
And the last one, it suddenly dawned on us that, you know, transportation could be an issue. So we had staff come in from South Carolina, Missouri Departments of Transportation in, in the feds. They can think it's going to be like a hurricane evacuation that day of the eclipse, which is both good news and bad news. But, I mean, those of you who drive the Beltway in D.C., you know what I'm talking about. I mean, that may look fun and friendly compared to what we may see. Please. in Portland and will be bussed down to Salem to see it. So what it, do they I, realize? That I don't think people do. I really don't. When you talk, and in fact, I'll show you. I think the next slide will answer your question. This is a graphic done by Michael Zeiler. You know, I, I love his maps, as you probably gathered. In his, his atlas of eclipses and things like that, yeah. road maps. Michael did a compilation of roads in and out, major interstates in and out of the path of totality, 95. It's already a zoo. Can you imagine what 95 in the Carolinas is going to be like? Then you talk about heading up through Nashville, um, St. Louis, Kansas City. Um, again, Nebraska is kind of maybe the spot. I don't know. Like I said, we're going to be close, and my plan, if it's cloudy, is to head west. But you start looking at the routes north and south, and so you have I-5 on the west coast. What Michael's doing, he's doing this for free, is he is going to make available an app you can download from his site that will allow you to get up-to-the-minute traffic and weather reports before the eclipse. Is that? Yes. And DOT data. So, but we know some DOT data can be good and I, how I gracefully say some sucks. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. No argument there. But I think back to March 7, 1970, you know, we, you, you know how the technology helps and otherwise. Another bit of advice, I'm getting close to the end here, is never quit looking. Three eclipses I've been to were really close calls. Maybe the most dramatic Debbie was at hybrid when we were on the ship off of Tahiti. That sounds like a hard life, but someone's got to do it. And it was completely, completely overcast. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe this is the one you just miss. Well, the captain was really attuned to what we needed. He took the cruise ship, and about 30 seconds before totality, you, you feel the ship just suddenly shift a lot. I'm thinking, what the heck? One hole he picked up on radar. The sun pops in. We see totality. The clouds move back over after totality, and it rains. It was just like, are you kidding me? Um, my son and I went to an eclipse in South Africa in 2002. And there were a whole bunch of people. This is outside of um, National Park. What's the big national park? You're outside of Kruger, yeah, thank you. And um, we were all set up, we set up our scopes, we polar aligned, and so it was myself, my son Jeremy, Jen and Vic Winter, and, and a hundred other people. About 30 minutes before totality, the clouds come rolling in. And again, I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's just it. You're gonna miss this one. And the shadow comes over. Well, believe it or not, what happens? About 45 seconds from the totality, we're watching, we're tracking. I'm taking pictures of the eclipse sun. Jeremy's making a movie. Jen and Vic are taking pictures. Later that night, a whole bunch of us went out to dinner. And my son sitting there talking to this guy saying, man, wasn't that great? We got to see the eclipse. The guy said, what are you talking about? We didn't see the eclipse. It was cloudy. So Jeremy says, you're standing five feet behind me. They quit looking. They quit looking. And it's like, oh, well, you know, here, Jeremy says, you know, 16-year-olds, they like doing this sort of stuff to people. Well, here's, here's the movie I made. It's okay. So let me give you a warning, and I know Dan's going to say this too. I love photography. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a solar system 
imager. I love imaging the moon. I love imaging eclipses. But don't get stuck behind a telescope or camera during the entire totality, especially if this is your first eclipse. You need to enjoy it. You need to take it in. It's a full body emotion type of thing. Even myself, I have a plan where I know what pictures I'm going to take. I'll take time to look around. I like to look at the colors, the shadow, what planets I can see, stars I can see, the shape of the corona, all that sort of thing. So make sure you do that. Make sure you take it in. Let me wrap up with this. This is the best writing I've ever found that describes totality. Because, you know, those of who have seen a total solar eclipse, it's so hard to say, this is what you're going to experience. Look at these pictures. Listen to what I'm saying. It's just hard until you see it and you'll understand what we're saying. So listen to this. This is written in 1896 for the 1896 eclipse by Mabel Loomis Todd. Then an instantaneous darkness leapt upon the world, an earthly night enveloped all. With an indescribable outflashing at the same instant, the corona birth burst forth in mysterious radiance. But dimly seen through a thin cloud, it was nevertheless beautiful beyond description, a celestial flame from some unimaginable heaven. Simultaneously, the whole northwestern sky, nearly to the zenith, was flooded with lurid and startling brilliant orange, across which drifted clouds slightly darker, like flecks of liquid flame or huge ejecta from some vast volcanic Hades. The west and southwest gleamed in shining lemon yellow. Least like a sunset, it was too somber and terrible. The pale, broken circle coronal light still glowed on with thrilling peacefulness while nature held her breath for another stage in this majestic spectacle. The best writing I've ever seen describing totality. So, you gotta experience it. You gotta go out and look up. And I wish you clear skies and the shadow. Um, we do have some, it, it, we've been talking about this since the first day of the star party. We do have a few eclipse goodies. And we'll wait till everybody's done. For those you may be interested in, my wife's smart enough, she can even take credit cards. She has one of those, what they call square swipe things. So, anyway, um, I don't, if we, do we want to move on and then take questions? Which I'm fine with. Um, let's take any specific questions okay. about this now. And, then we'll and remember, you can ask about north, south, east, west. Thank you. <laughs> you can ask about north, south, east, west. Okay? And, it's fine. I want to emphasize uh, Mike brought some stuff which is valuable resource material or reference material at any level of eclipse interest. So you should take a look at it. And I think the, the postcards are neat to send back to your friends who didn't go. And especially if you send or send them to yourself. Or send it to yourself. Send it three days in advance. Say, That's wow, right. So, so that what a great can, eclipse. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any questions for, for Mike? First time question. What's the, what's the total width um, and mileage of the totality? About 67 miles. Total width is about 67 miles. It's, a, it's, you know, it's not a long duration totality, two minutes and 42 seconds or something along that line in southern Illinois. Um, but it's totality, so about 67 miles. And, and follow up, do, do you see any difference? You're in totality from one side to the other. Do you know, have you, you've seen it in different, like right on the center line versus to the edge? What happens when you get more towards the edge? Great question. What happens when you get more towards the edge? You get a little less and a little less totality and you get more prolonged Bailey's beads. So what you have there is the sun basically, the moon is grazing the sun, like a grazing occultation. So you have lunar mountains and valleys and beads of light just stream along that edge. I've only seen one grazing eclipse and it was pretty spectacular. And that was one of the ones that was cloudy and everybody quit looking except two of us and got photographs of it. Just way cool, so I, I get a little excited about this. I yes, I have a related question to yeah. that. I was wondering because this one is not very long, which means the moon is closer inside. That's to correct. The sun, does that mean we're likely to see more prominences? Probably depends on the sun's activity. More prominences, more opportunity for a better view of the chromosphere. The best chromosphere view I've ever seen was the shortest eclipse, 30 seconds. It's a hybrid. 
And the, the chromosphere is round, red chromosphere. It's beautiful. And the beads were spectacular too. So, yeah. Yes, please. Um, so you said you've seen 18 eclipses so uh -huh. far. Um, and a lot of people who have been to that many eclipses um, have done sort of data collection um, to answer different questions, the shape of the moon, things like the how big is totality, things like that. So in all of your 18 eclipses, have you done any type of data collection? I, have, I've, I look exclusively at the shape of the corona. Okay. I'm interested in coronal lines and the shape of the corona compared to the actual... Um, you know, sunspot count and activity on the sun itself. That's my interest. A kind of passing interest is, is more of a beauty than it is it's qualitative totally, is the colors around the horizon. It's gorgeous. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm very interested in the coronal shape, streamers and versus activity. That's one of the reasons I like the photography. It gives me that sort of data to be able to analyze. Yeah, uh, where's a good place to go to get a picture of the sky at totality so that you can identify the planets and stars that are nearby because the time is very brief. I think the higher the sun it will be in the sky, which means more towards that mid path, like, like you know, St. Louis down to Illinois into Western Kentucky, but your sc the sun will be higher in the sky. And so, a little higher. Well, anywhere the sun's the highest in the sky, but once you get down to, towards the horizon, like in Oregon versus even um, the Carolinas, especially you know, Charleston, you know, well, Charleston, you got, you know, the weather may be the issue there, but a higher sun would be the best. Because again, you would think, of, just think about observing. When you go out and observe, you want your objects as high up as you no, can get them. Well, I was thinking, where, what website can I go to get oh. a picture of that moment to take with me because the time is very short to identify Something interesting. Yeah, any app will do it. Yeah, put in an app and see. Yeah, check it out. That, that I agree. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood your question. It was a dumb answer this time, not a dumb question. Other questions? All right, Will. This, this might be a dumb question. Nah. How do you keep. Um, where, where you have a star party, I mean, a sun eclipse, a solar eclipse party, and you got uh, people of all ages there, and uh, you, you, you don't want them to damage your eyes, so you have somebody call in the time. No, I use a taser. <laughs> I mean, because keeps them know, keeps them inactive. It doesn't take much sun no, to, no, we, to hurt your eyes. Let me tell you what they're doing in St. Joseph. Uh, Michael Bockich, you no know name, he's a senior editor for astronomy. He is arranged with the radio stations to do a broadcast where he'll talk to people about over the radio about hey time to take your glasses off put your glasses back on don't look at send those sort of warnings so I know that's what he's doing there yeah there are some really good we were talking about that some some good apps out there you know glasses off watch for diamond ring glasses back on 10 seconds of diamond ring that sort of thing so it's not dumb. That's a great question. When you start to see the diamond ring, you can definitely take your glasses off. Well, okay. This is a recording. I'll just say it. I usually take my filter and glasses off about 45 seconds before diamond ring. Right. I know. Bad. Bad, Mikey. Bad. But yeah. I like, you can see my diamond ring photos. Okay. And I'm not going to stare at the, the scope. Got my glasses off. I'm ready. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just using caution. I would not advise telling the general public that sort of thing. But all of you are smart enough. You, you know, do what you're comfortable with, too. Yeah, you're using a very view, sort of. Absolutely. So, I almost sound like the three blind mice now, don't I? <laughs> Take off your goggles four minutes before totality and stare at a 93%. Okay. Well, it's not a good time to look through no. an amplified device. No, it's not. Just put naked eye. You know, some people wear eye patches to dark adapt. I tried that once, and I really felt all woozy woozy during totality. It was one eye was dark adapted, one eye wasn't, and it just really threw me for a loop. I said, boy, that's quite some eclipse I'm seeing up there. <laughs> 3D is spinning around, too, so... But some people love that, so. 
<laughs> That's true. <laughs> You're right, Harlan. All right, thank you so much, and I'll be around again to talk later on. And again, it's been great being here with all of you.